Hello, 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 dear listeners. Welcome to another episode of the Pursuit of Scrappiness podcast. Whether you're building a business, running a team, or just starting out in your career, we are here to bring you scrappy and actionable insights to help you become more productive. My name is Old Star Outcounts, and my co-host is Hi, sir. Hey, everyone. Before we start, a quick reminder, follow us on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple. It helps more than you know. And in exchange to that, you will find almost 180 episodes. They're covering all, to uh, all topics uh, to help you become a scrappier and better version of yourself in life and in business. Plenty explore, go subscribe and be the first one to know when we come out every Tuesday morning. And great news for the video lovers. As I said, you can now see us on YouTube. So go on the pursuit of scrappiness uh, on YouTube and get immersed into the world of scrappiness. About today's topic, um, we are kind of c continuing our half intentional series of having s different domain experts um, talking about different valuable topics to help you build. And today we want to talk to a founder who has built a formidable business by helping companies produce higher quality software. Uh, so please welcome Erwin Greenfelds. Hi, Erwin. Hi, uh, thanks for inviting me. Happy to be here. Yeah, so Edwins is the co-founder of Test Dev Lab. It's a quality assurance and testing service provider uh, out of Riga, Latvia, uh, originally. That has been on the market for more than 10 years. It has accumulated an impressive client base, including the likes of Microsoft, Zoom, Discord, Pinterest, Twilio, and many more household names. So the company uh, has not taken outside investment as far as we know, and its revenue is north of 20 million euros. I don't know. That, that's like was well, a, a few years ago. I don't, I don't even know where it's now. I couldn't find the data, but, uh, but uh, doing quite well with the bootstrap model. Um, so what's behind the business? So, so let's dive in. And the first question that I wanted to ask was, what should founders and maybe non-technical business leaders actually know about quality assurance in software development and why it's important? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good good question. So um, let me kind of tell that uh, many companies with whom we work, uh, quite uh, many founders uh, or kind of non-technical business people engage with us only when they see the consequences of lack of testing. Um, no, that's true. Uh, and uh, w w what it means, you know, like uh, in many cases, it could be poor customer reviews for the product. It could be maybe frequent outages, uh, what they see. It could be maybe security problems, what they face. Sometimes it even could be legal consequences if it's not designed properly, like many situations. And, and that's the situation when uh, many companies engage with us. I mean, obviously, it's maybe a bit too late. But that's when, uh, you know, like, uh, people realize that uh, it's kind of, uh, that, that they need somebody to help with some sort of quality assurance. So that's one case. But the second uh, example also is that, um, they saying that, um, uh, they uh, uh, saying that there is kind of huge difference between good product and great product. And that's another aspect, you know, like where we can uh, help. Sometimes it's just not enough, uh, that product works. It needs to work perfectly on multiple different devices, on different network configurations. Uh, it has to be perfectly designed, let's say, even from accessibility perspective or many other aspects. And those small details make a difference, you know, like from good product to great product. So to, some, to, 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 to give kind of summary, you know, like one reason why testing is needed is to avoid huge consequences, be it uh, security breaches, be it outages, be it uh, very poor customer reviews. And second reason is to make a differentiating factor from good to great product. So that's simply good. Um, one thing you mentioned actually about this, this one, I can totally believe that it ha when the people look for help after something has happened, not before. And uh, even accessibility, like if you if you don't meet the standards of the industry, I mean, like, in, for example, you operate in the US, it also can like open you up for, for um, even litigation in the worst case, like if, if, if you have this. So like all these things you don't think about when you're just starting to build a business, but all these things that when you grow become more more and more important. And especially like there's also being in products is also there's this bias always that, you know, people who work in the team have certain set of phones and whatever, very often iPhones or newest Samsungs and all works great, but 
but her customers maybe have different phones. And so, yeah, uh, interesting business that, that we don't think enough about, I think. No, exactly. And uh, um, actually, kind of this kind of uh, access to wide uh, variety of phones is also something that we accumulated over the years. At the moment, we have more than 4,000 devices in our office. And it actually looks physically like that. You know, like if we go to different uh, storage spaces, uh, we open up a rack with devices and you can see hundreds uh, and thousands of different phones. Uh, different kind of manufacturers, different operating systems, different screen sizes. But imagine, you know, like if product has millions or even billions of users, it's so important that we can test uh, on exactly those devices, on exactly those operating systems, configurations, what potentially end users might have. And uh, sometimes it may look, you know, like, hey, what's the reason to test on you know, iPhone 7 on all the operating system, but some specific product maybe have hundreds of thousands of users, you know, like, and if suddenly some specific feature or product is not working at all on that phone, it could have huge consequences. Maybe it doesn't sound relevant for fresh company startup, you know, like with very small user base, but as the company grows, as kind of user base, uh, you know, becomes quite, quite, quite large, those details kind of matter a lot. And another point uh, you also kind of spot on um, mentioned uh, uh, around accessibility, you know, like not only, um, I mean, of course, on one hand, it's the right thing to do, you know, like so uh, many people can properly use those digital products. But on on other hand, there is a Digital Accessibility Act uh, uh, and uh, there might be even legal consequences for many products companies if they are not designing properly their products. Uh, so that's another kind of angle to look at. Uh. I can definitely attest from my personal experience. You don't need a big number of users, but if there is something that doesn't work on an obscure device in a, in a corner case, you will definitely have some user who has that case and they're going to complain and then clog up your customer support and mm -hmm. annoy your team. It's, it's bound to happen, especially if you have something that relates to uh, using the camera on the phone. I think that is the, that is the, the the place where you can really go into big trouble and and really need some proper testing. Yeah, and sometimes we like to say that uh, our, our potential customers are companies who have something to lose, um, and uh, by that uh, we mean you know like a company could lose reputation, you know like if uh, if they release bad quality product, uh, it could be money, you know like uh, or legal legal consequences, you know like if there's some let's say you know like especially e-commerce sites they. Uh, do some um, active uh, product sales and if there's outage of system, uh, you know, like, of course, there's you know, significant uh, losses for a company. Mm -hmm. So once companies mature enough that they have something to lose, be it reputation, be it money, uh, be it any kind of legal potential consequences, it's definitely a time to uh, thoroughly think, you know, like, what's the kind of testing processes, do they kind of test thoroughly the product? Are they insured, you know, like against possible incidents? Good point, actually. You know, Black Friday coming up I, for a lot of brands, Christmas or time after <laughs> Christmas is a peak, peak season. Any interruption there, it's just going to cost you so much that, uh, that this, I don't know, extra money that you spend on extra QA will, will look minuscule. Yeah, makes sense. Exactly, exactly. Sometimes, you know, like, there is uh, analogy, you know, like, this testing is a insurance, you know, like, you invest uh, some amount of resources, money, to make sure that, you know, like, you properly test those products or kind of establish right kind of testing practices, and that significantly can mitigate the risks of potential bad outcomes what can happen. And, and you know, it takes... Uh, uh, it takes some maturity for companies to understand it. And uh, as I kind of told initially, Sometimes, you know, like uh, companies realize it through pain, you know, like once they kind of uh, encountered some kind of problems, but uh, some companies already, you know, like know it and establish right kind of testing practices from beginning building products. Okay, but teams usually are small in the beginning, in, in, yeah. in, except for some, some exceptional cases. So what kind of, I don't know, uh, ways for, for scrappy small teams uh, to ensure a decent 
QA level and when, when their engineers are few and the money is scarce, and maybe maybe AI can help somehow here. How to how to make sure that that uh, you know you you get get a good result and not break the bank. Yeah, and that makes make, 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 make sense. And uh, I, I can completely agree that you know, like for very small teams, uh, it's probably not wise immediately to let's say get external testing team. You know, like it's not maybe most rational uh, for for very kind of early startup or, or product team. But there are a couple of things that I would recommend. Number one, definitely, is uh, invest in training. You know, just to get. Uh, uh, a bit of external help uh, about QA mindset, uh, uh, and somebody you know externally could easily kind of explain, uh, for example, some good practices like peer testing. Uh, so kind of come up with a project that even if there's no testers in a team, maybe kind of one developer could properly review other's code, also do some black box testing, also explain about risk risk based testing kind of uh, strategies, meaning that to map what are most important use cases with highest impact and at least to test those to make sure there is, there is no kind of severe consequences. Um, it could be also, you know, like making sure to establish testing as a discipline, even with developers, product owners or designers. Sometimes just, you know, like engineers or other kind of members in a team don't like to do it, but it makes sense even to spend at least some time of, uh, of testing. Uh, um, uh, is a code or products that you're building. And about other part about AI, you know, to be honest, you know, that's, that's a good question. And we get to, uh, asked it quite, quite a lot. Uh, um, I mean, there's no simple answer, but you know, like when it comes to testing, uh, we don't see that AI can help more comparing to any other kind of discipline. Um, AI is kind of good help also for engineering. You know, developers can get a good, um, good help using AI tools, the same with testing. Of course, it can help to produce some test cases, test scenarios, give some tips, but it's nowhere near to replace uh, actual testing or actual testing on physical devices. And one of the kind of key reasons why it is like that, because, I mean, it's in, in most cases, you know, like products, they don't have any kind of good documentation no good description what is exact behavior. Frequently product owners, founders, designers, or engineers only in discussions with, with testing team, we can get a sense what, exa what exactly is intended behavior. And it's, it's, it, it can't be done, at least not at, at this moment uh, with any uh, AI tools. They can be kind of great uh, um, uh, assistance for testers. Uh, but uh, there is no tools that can replace uh, good quality uh, testing done by humans. You know what uh, is like one thing you can never replace. It's like it's it's like a CEO or highest level manager finding a bug and the new software that you can uh, like n that nobody spotted, but like it's always going to happen to the <laughs> to the main guys. That's like. Mm -hmm. That's something that I that I found as uh, as building products that that once you step into this user mode, you suddenly become really stupid. You know, you might be mm. building yourself some 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 kind of really sophisticated platform and and web service, but mm -hmm. as soon as you become a user, suddenly you cannot find the right button. Suddenly nothing works. Mm. Suddenly it, it, all all of this experience building doesn't really save you from uh, from then being a clumsy user being stuck in all kinds mm. of issues. So uh, so yeah, um, let's talk a bit more about your business. So. It's it's kind of selling a combination of software and human service. Maybe you can explain a bit more how it works. Uh, this this combination, and um, I was just wondering what like how does this model scale? Uh, is it easy to scale? And and what what challenges do you face uh, or have you faced uh, since since you stepped on this journey and uh, and grew the business? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I will start uh, in a way how we uh, typically pitch ourselves to existing and new customers. Uh, we like to say that we are one stop shop when it comes to providing different quality assurance services, products and different innovative laboratories. Uh, by services, uh, we mean be it manual tests, automated testing, security testing, usability, accessibility, 
audio, video, you name it, essentially one-stop shop for all different uh, testing needs. Uh, by laboratories, we mean we have multiple innovative laboratories in our offices where we can do, for example, network conditioning. We can emulate 2G, 3G, uh, 5G networks. Uh, we can uh, record any specific scenarios like airport network, uh, network in different kind of cafes, play it back in our laboratories to see how it behaves. We have GPS emulation laboratory where we can actually kind of emulate real-life GPS signals and uh, test uh, products that kind of rely on GPS signals. We have laboratories for uh, battery and performance testing where we can um, see precisely what is the impact on battery life uh, by sp some specific product. We even have chambers where we can change temperature, which sounds maybe a bit why, but it's actually quite frequent request uh, by many companies to see how application behaves. Uh, let's say phone is in cold temperatures outside. Uh, uh, what happens on like if there's kind of warmer temperatures, so we can do, do, do that as well. So that's a lot, uh, and uh, by laboratories, the last thing is audio video testing laboratories. Uh, also specific uh, rooms where we can do echo cancellation testing, noise suppression testing, and by video also dedicated rooms where we can uh, test reliably video quality in specific, we call it black, black, black rooms with now also lighting, uh, where we can reliably test what is video quality in different network conditions, different devices, parameters. So that's the laboratory part. And um, as a third part are products. Uh, we have multiple different products, like one is called Lodero, which is SaaS tool for load and performance testing. Uh, we also have invented many algorithms on our own uh, for predicting mostly audio and video quality scores. Uh, one algorithm which I'm quite proud of is um, uh, algorithm that um, that is trained to give precise score of video quality. Let's say in this video call we are at the moment where we are at the moment uh, with our trained algorithm, it could reliably say that video quality score is, for example, 4.5. And it will describe also with, um, uh, with, with high detail why it rated it like that. For example, it could describe because uh, it had three freezes for one second, and at some point uh, video degraded from HD to 360p, and many other maybe kind of descriptions. So it gives very reliable and accurate information of video quality. That's that's. Um, uh, algorithm solutions that we created. And the uh, question about scaling is a really good one. Uh, of course, services part um, is purely dependent on um, people, on engineers, and that's quite hard. You know, like it goes down to resource management. Uh, uh, that's the reason why we have uh, opened offices not only in Latvia, in six cities, but also across all Baltics. Uh, uh, so we have office in uh, um, Tartu, Estonia, we have office in Vilnius, uh, Lithuania. Also, we opened an office um, in Skopje, North Macedonia, with around 80 people. Uh, and uh, we have office also in Malaga, Spain. And that's uh, the challenge of scaling team, because as, as the more demand we have uh, on services part, uh, the scaling happens uh, by uh, getting new talent, by getting new people and opening kind of new offices or exist, extending existing one. Uh, of course, better, so, better situation is with product scaling, like uh, products like Lodero, which is SaaS-based load testing product, or our video quality detection algorithm. Those are more like SaaS products and tools which uh, can scale way more uh, easier from business point of view. And, uh, and of course, you know, like uh, from business perspective, we are putting, uh, let's say, kind of uh, quite high priority on product part to see how we can build them even better, how we can scale them even faster, um, as, 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 as it allows a much better kind of scaling perspective comparing to services part. So that's a short, short how do answer. You, yeah. How do you how do you determine like uh, where to where to go, how to where, where to open a new office? And uh, like you mentioned, North Macedonia, maybe not like a clear uh, answer why, right? It immediately yeah, comes yeah. to mind. So uh, it's uh, <laughs> good, good good question. I mean, it's uh, North Macedonia. Actually, it was uh, interesting story. We had um, 
uh, from Spain. Uh, we had the one gal, uh, really good uh, so-called engineer. She was living and working in Spain, but or- or- originally she was from North Macedonia. And uh, I think it was back in 2020, uh, we were growing super fast, and it was just not impossible to hire people in Latvia at that pace that we needed. And uh, we started to explore different countries, looked where we can open office, where we could do some hiring. And uh, then our employee uh, from Spain, but originally, as I told, she was from North Macedonia, she told, why why don't you try North Macedonia? Uh, she pitched to us that uh, there are really smart engineers, uh, good uh, communication, good technical skills, uh, culture-wise similar uh, to, 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 to us. Uh, so uh, saying that, we thought, okay, why, why not to try? You know, like uh, initially we are not 100% convinced, but uh, we started to put um, advertisements, you know, like seeking for uh, uh, quality engineers and engineers in general uh, and uh, putting some ads, you know, like in, in the local market. And, and to our surprise, number one, uh, there were a lot of applic- applications uh, comparing, let's say, to Baltics, uh, you know, like typically, you know, like if you look for especially kind of experienced software engineers or quality engineers, you don't get very many kind of applications. So number one, uh, a lot of uh, applications. And number two, quality uh, of people who applied were really great. Uh, I mean, most interviews we had were really decent ones with uh, well English, good technical skills, good motivation, good attitude. And uh, we immediately kind of got the sense that uh, it's good, 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 good market to hire talent. So we uh, went there, uh, opened actual office, uh, created uh, um, also daughter company, uh, legal entity, so we can properly hire people uh, there. And 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 uh, that also was relatively easy. That was back in COVID times, and we did everything remotely. So opening company, um, signing office leads, uh, opening bank account. Uh, uh, it was done remotely, of course, using notary and, and so on, but, but it was an um, uh, interesting kind of experience, but it, it, it was possible to do so. Uh, so we opened office and started active hiring. And uh, uh, yeah, as I told, at the moment we have 80 people and uh, really kind of good uh, location for, 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 for a talent there. About Baltics, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, I mean, just made sense, you know, like those are neighboring countries and, uh, and, um, and, uh, close by, easy travel, easy commute, visiting offices, uh, uh, in Lit- Lithuania, for example, uh, we started to hire a really strong, experienced country manager who helped us and still uh, helps us to, uh, grow as a team, uh, also, uh, ma- managers, you know, like day to day kind of activities in Lithuania. Um, and that turns out also to be quite successful. Uh, I think at the moment we have more than 20 people already in business office. In terms of scale, you, you mentioned that you have this product side and mm-hmm. it would be a natural assumption that, that, that it scales easier. So it, it must be bigger, must, must grow faster. But in your experience and in your business, has it been so? Is it? Like what? What's the kind no. of split between services, <laughs> no, no, and product, no. and uh, and how? How? What, what's the growth? Like, uh, can you still um, do like a double-digit growth uh, every uh, year? You know, or or triple-digit growth yeah. with uh, with services? Yeah, no, it's um, yeah, good good question. So n- n- number one, you know, like we are. Uh, if you look kind of this year, we are targeting something like twenty-six million uh, revenue. Uh, twenty-six million. Uh, and um, if we look, uh, let's say, from a financial perspective, uh, only tiny part is product revenue. But we look at it differently. We use those products more like as an accelerators uh, or door openers, you know, like we can call it like that, because uh, those innovative products, once we attract companies to use them, uh, then we can start discussions about expanding cooperation also with, uh, to, to use other kind of testing services, be it test automation, be it security testing, accessibility testing, and that drives uh, most income uh, for, 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 for us. And, and that's conscious decision. We are not trying to 
let's say, uh, price tag uh, or, or earn kind of directly from products with a huge revenue streams that they use them more to attract customers, uh, secure them, and then then it also kind of cross sell different uh, services that we have. But saying that, uh, there is kind of trending line upwards even for direct uh, product revenues that we have. Okay. And you mentioned selling and, and, and I mentioned Zoom, Orange, mm-hmm. Microsoft, Twilio, Discord, like great great logos to have on your on your website so maybe you can talk about the sales channels that you have used that have worked and tactics that have worked best for you how to how to get to such clients sure product is one yes that you already mentioned what what yeah, else? Yeah. Uh, sure. so uh number one that uh it, it's kind of one step back you know but number one that helped a lot our company myself and also uh, second co-founder uh, andres uh, both of us used uh, uh, to work in Skype before funding Tesla Lab. Myself, I spent around eight or nine years working in Skype in Estonia, in Sweden afterwards. Uh, I was managing Skype for iOS engineering team back then. Uh, also, that helped to build very strong uh, connections uh, within company uh, from engineering uh, as well as kind of business kind of groups. And uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows how important are connections and kind of personal re- relationships and probably you're all also kind of had about term like skype mafia um, and uh, it, it, it means that uh, uh, even people who um, uh, after skype who created their own companies or who work in different co- co- corporations worldwide they somehow help each other you know like with recommendations with referrals and see how how how, how can kind of uh, how they can help each other and that helped us definitely initially uh, to secure uh, initial uh, deals just using our personal network and uh, and and close initial kind of testing uh, contracts uh, uh, and that works quite well uh, even now you know like personal network personal connections that's uh, um, something that works quite well, well your your first non-estonian from like the skype <laughs> mafia network we have spoken to quite a few of them it's it's fun to see that there yeah, are we, 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 we had we, there were a couple of latvians yeah yeah mm. uh, yeah, my, but, my, yeah my, but you're you're not super loud about it i mean it's, it's uh, crazy you've been on the market for so long and obviously we're familiar with your company but it's somehow um not not maybe a critique but uh, just uh, just just noting that that yeah that mm. uh, it's not that we have been uh, he- yeah. hearing that much about uh, you know the Skype mafia in Latvia building this great company etc it's it's uh, i guess uh, maybe estonians are a bit more active maybe yeah no, that's yeah. actually good 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 point i mean we mentioned it of course you know but it's not that we are uh, su- super uh, vocal but yes yeah, so myself i joined back in 2007 that was in time when just eBay uh, acquired kind of Skype and been there through kind of all journey, you know, like it was kind of later uh, private equity company, Silver Lake, kind of bought and afterwards, of course, Microsoft. Uh, so it was kind of in, in, in interesting journey. But a bit kind of continuing to your question about sales. Um, uh, so personal network connections that definitely is one, one, one thing that works because, and, and especially in software testing, because software testing is trust. Trust is one of the important aspects, uh, what companies look for when they select a software testing kind of partner. Uh, they need to make sure that they can trust with their confidential data, with their unreleased products. And, uh, and, and get a sense that somebody will actually do good, good quality, uh, work, you know, like for them. So that trust is important aspect also why those personal connections works quite well. But saying that uh, there's another, uh, source that works quite well for us. And that is, um, marketing, content marketing. We invest a lot in, uh, technical blog posts technical articles, uh, we go to conferences as technical speakers, uh, let's say discuss about audio video innovations, audio video testing, and uh, those things bring us good, high quality inbound leads. And there's nothing better than high quality inbound lead who uh, have found us, who done research and uh, 
uh, right uh, with specific need saying, hey, we would like to test the audio quality. We see that you are great in what you do. Uh, can we have a chat, you know, like, and, and of course, also the best uh, possible leads. And uh, that's why we are investing a lot uh, in um, content marketing, digital ads, uh, and uh, get, getting good, good, many high quality kind of leads from that. Zoom actually was uh, the one uh, company who found us uh from uh from from different articles that we generate from blogs uh and that that works quite quite well and the sad ones which also works quite okay are conferences but by conferences i mean only and only if we go uh, with uh, stand with speakers if we make a presence in conference if uh, if 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 somebody goes with a conference as an att- attendee <laughs> it's come this way. In most cases, you know, because you know, like it's we we, we never seen that to be. Yeah, you come back with free pens and at least Ex- exactly yeah. and, and a hangover. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's typically one salesperson trying to sell something to other salesperson, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and then exchanging kind of business cards. But if, if it's a good conference and uh, um, if we have kind of booth presence. Uh, um, technical kind of uh, speech uh, then 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 it makes sense and it works i want to ask like a lot of companies who start in b2b space of course the dream of of clients that, that we just discussed that you guys have uh they will probably start with unless the network allows to start with smaller companies maybe and what's the from your perspective, is there a difference and what is the difference of servicing like giants of the world versus servicing just normal, successful, good businesses that are like just local? Is there a difference? And yeah, can you talk about that? Of course. uh, Yes, of of, of course it is, you know, like, and uh, maybe kind of a couple of examples. So when it comes to those large businesses, big, big, big companies, so one of the, um, I would say, you know, main reasons how they select and look uh, testing partners is uh, again this trust and confidentiality. If they can kind of assess if they can really and trust their private confidential data to third party, and sometimes it's very long and painful process. Um, the audit certifications. Audit certifications. Like that. That's why we have all. ISO certifications. That's why we are renewing our certifications every year. And and what's interesting is that sometimes um, I can't mention exact kind of client names, but sometimes not only they uh, audit uh, our company, but they also audit country where over, where kind of testing services are actually coming from. Let's say if it's Latvia, they take a look, independent look, what is political stability. Um, what is kind of legislation, what, how it will look like in the future, get some kind of different kind of insights to see if they can actually and trust uh, uh, testing services uh, for us. Many of those companies require quite a lot upfront investments uh, that need to be done by us in order to build secure testing rooms, secure laboratories, uh, physical um physical security kind of uh, requirements that need to be incorporated in in in, in our offices and uh, does that come before or after signing a contract uh well it com- t- t- typically it works like that it says um we know that if we will do it there's quite uh, high likelihood that we will get the work so uh and Short answer is after, but you know, like, of course, we assess, you know, like when it makes sense and when it doesn't make sense uh, to, to, to do it. Uh, and sometimes it makes sense to do it because, I mean, all business is risky, you know, like we, we see that we do that investment and very likely we will get a really good long term, let's say, partnership deal with company X and then and, and, and we go for it, we do it. But going back to your question, uh, so that confidentiality trust is one of the primary reasons what uh, bigger companies look for uh, to make to, to to be absolutely sure that uh, uh, products what they will send to companies that they can trust fully uh, 
a company. Price is secondary, you know, like especially for, for bigger companies. Of course, they look, you know, like what is the most reasonable price, but but uh, but if it would be only in market for cheapest price, we would not exist. You know, like pro- probably probably they would we would be out of the business on kind of day one. And and second reason also what the bigger companies like and value a lot our ability uh, to provide different testing services so that they don't need to look for uh, multiple vendors. Uh, so if it's automation, we can do it. If it's accessibility testing, we can do it. If it's load performance testing, we can do it. If it's security, we can do it. And they value it a lot. And uh, that it's one partner that did one contract, one um, let's say security assessment, and then they can um, um, use multiple, let's say, kind of testing uh, services, products, or, or use of our laboratories. Uh, for smaller companies, of course, it's uh, somewhat easier. Uh, there's no uh, such high typically security measures. Of course, there still is, but it's 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 typically not 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 in kind of that uh, level. But then, it, I hope it's worth the money to 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 get those clients. Well, it is. I mean, we are quite okay, you know, like when, when, uh, from kind of a financial perspective. Uh, but when it, it's, um, it's also, it's maybe not so related, you know, like, but, uh, what you can tell, and, and everybody probably kind of seen is that uh, in IT industry, excellent years were 2019, 20, 21, 22. Uh, I mean, of course, partly due to COVID and huge digital transformations that happened in that time. I mean, I, IT just skyrocketed, you know, like sometimes was, uh, the dem- demand was so uh, huge that the problem is hiring uh, right people, right kind of experts uh, to keep up with demand. Uh, and back in 2023, already end of 2022, it was a bit of um, a chill down, you know, like across kind of all IT industry, you know, like a lot of companies did, um, they overhired kind of people, a lot of layoffs, a lot of um, um, budget cuts, you know, like, and it somehow slowed down industry. Uh, it's recovering now, but definitely, at least from our perspective, not in levels, you know, like how it kind of used to be. Everybody's a bit more careful, you know, like these days, uh, comparing to uh, three or four years ago. So you have built this business uh, without outside investment, uh, or as we like to yes. call it, and and others also uh, customer funded. Um, is it a conscious choice? Is it your business model? Is it, uh, yeah? And have you felt like it has been holding you back at some points, or or you're completely happy with that? Yeah, it's uh, it, it was conscious decision, and and of course, kind of primary reason was uh, freedom and flexibility. Uh, of course, you know, like if we are uh, uh, just two co-founders, we can be very flexible in what we do, how we do, what business decisions we take, uh, where we invest uh, uh, profits that we uh, how uh, what we do with that. Uh, so that gives. Uh, Freedom and flexibility, and that was conscious decision. Second, of course, um, um, we are in mostly services business, which means that quite early um, after a funding company, we already had healthy revenue stream, meaning that we were able to fund uh, uh, operational costs, salaries, office rent, and and uh, equipment kind of purchases, which. Um, uh, not always is possible if you build a product, you know, like uh, it, 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 it uh, only after kind of uh, probably kind of longer time will, will bring revenue for, for us. It was quite early enough uh, in a business. So, uh, yes, conscious decision. I mean, of course, never say never, you know, like uh, market is evolving, our company is kind of changing and, and uh, uh, everything is on the table. But at this time, we have been kind of profitable every single year with good EBITDA numbers, good profitability, and uh, and there hasn't been, you know, like so far, let's say, real need uh, for external kind of investments. Uh, uh, so we'll see what future kind of will bring, uh, but, but that was conscious decision from uh, day one. Are, are, are VCs knocking on your door or have they given up? or? 
no, of course, you know, like of, of course we and 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 time by time we have discussions, you know, like we we like to see what what it uh, means and uh, but for 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 us uh, it's not so much that we need external money influx if uh, there would be good strategic alignment which could maybe help at some point to I mean triple revenue in a few years or or build some 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 huge value you know like that we would see uh, outside of uh, of money we would be open uh, to discuss and see i mean it's business in the end but uh, but but uh, situations you know like where there's just uh, let's say money for specific amount of uh, shares in companies that's something that is not very interesting uh, uh, for, for, for a company you mentioned that you're two founders and you need, you know, just just two two opinions to to make a decision. However, you know, they also say that that two is uh, especially 50-50 is, uh, you know, the worst combination of of what to have in terms of if you have disagreement then there's basically no way how to how to uh, get out of a deadlock or resolution. Um how has that, you know, two founder setup uh, worked for you? Has it uh, has it ever been an issue? or or uh, something that you had to overcome and figure out ways how to uh, dispute um, resolve resolve disputes or or kind of uh, stuck decision making yeah uh, i mean i believe we have been quite lucky in that sense uh, it's true that i have seen and heard you know like about many kind of different kind of stories that it kind of um and uh, doesn't turn out uh, uh, well, but uh, in our case, we've been kind of quite lucky. And I think there are kind of a couple of reasons. One reason is that uh, I do believe both of us uh, as a co-founders are quite rational and smart. Uh, if we have kind of different opinions, we like to ra- rationalize it on a, a whiteboard to see, you know, like what are different pros, cons. Uh, and, um, and after that, you know, like we typically can sense, you know, like what, what, what to do. In many cases, if it's not strategic decision, but just some operational decision, we typically don't mind, you know, like if, if I have some kind of uh, uh, good idea, I just go for it and do it the same, you know, like uh, Andre's co-founder, I don't mind, you know, like for, for operational kind of reasons, we even don't need kind of to synchronize, you know, like if it's strategic decision, of course, we brainstorm and, you know, try to uh, rationalize, you know, like what is, uh, what, what, what is best. Uh, so far, it's been kind of working out quite uh, well, but I think also important aspect is that we are primarily services company. It probably would be more harder if it would be uh, primarily product company, you know, like where we're building product with specific roadmap, specific uh, um, business kind of uh, plan. Uh, it probably could be more challenging for service company. It is, uh, uh, at least in my mind, uh, somewhat easier uh, to share those uh, uh, on their responsibilities. Well, since it is a service company and you have more than 500 people uh, helping you provide that service, and obviously those people are are uh, yeah, in in some ways also the face of the company, something that your clients are, are, mm-hmm. are facing and interacting. In, in terms of managing such kind of uh, workforce, uh, uh, just came up with this kind of thought experiment. If you would yeah. have to go to you know a, de- a desert island with with all five hundred of them, you know what is the three management or slash organizational tools that you would definitely not survive uh, without? What what is kind of the main? Uh, it can be practices, it can be tools, it can. Be, mm-hmm. What what kind of is the yeah. the major things for you? Uh, yeah. So yeah, good 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 question. So I will uh, probably. I mean, one, uh, those are probably more like practices, you know, like, because tools, tools are probably not so interesting. Everybody can have used collaboration tools, uh, Google Cloud, Jira, uh, Slack, Discord, you know, like whatever, but, but that, that is a given, of course. But, but I think what, what, what we, what couple of things, you know, like that we try to establish within, uh, our kind of culture and processes is, uh, number one, uh, when it comes to management, even myself, co-founder, as well as our technical directors, we like to keep policy where we are open to have discussions with anyone in the company. So anyone at any given point of time could come up to us 
uh, have a discussion, share some ideas, uh, share feedback, uh, uh, discuss anything, you know, like what they how. Like we, we like to create this kind of open policy, you know, like where every single kind of employee, even intern, could uh, come by, set up a meeting, and then and, 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 uh, chat about anything, you know, like what's, what's on their mind. And, that we have, and do they? You know, Actually, yes, you know, like ma- many of them, not, uh, but many, ma- 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 many, yes, you know, like, uh, and 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 sometimes those are very interesting kind of discussions, you know, like it, it helps to understand what what really happens in uh, in a company, what's the feedback. Sometimes they have really good insights and feedback uh, about uh, what's uh, happening uh, within their projects. Uh, so, it, but yeah, so that's that, that's one thing. Second thing is. Um, uh, we have, I would say, uh, with more than 500 people, many companies have, but I, I, I think for us it would be extremely hard uh, to live without. It's called like performance and development system. Uh, there are people who love it and people who hate it. Uh, but uh, it, no, I mean, obviously it's in any company, but but it would be impossible not have one uh, because there's so many questions for Everyone, like, how can I advance in my career? How I can get a uh, higher salary? When I can reach X amount of, uh, you know, uh, uh, raise? What, what need to be done? Uh, what certifications I need to do? What need to happen in my project? And, and we invested a lot in building quite robust and clear performance and development system with clear expectations, salary levels, uh, what need to be done. And how to advance in Korea. And, and again, you know, like I'm saying, there are people who love it, people who hate it, but without uh, such system, it would be just impossible to manage 500 uh, employees and give some basis, you know, like for, 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 for everybody how they can kind of operate. So no, it's extremely, it's extremely important, especially in a, in a competitive labor market situation when people come and ask, what do I need to do to get X amount of salary and you don't have an answer? <laughs> uh, it kind of takes all the power away from you. And, uh, and, and basically then you end up uh, all the time bargaining, trying to kind of uh, fight off some kind of poachers and, and all these things. So it's, it's really great that you have it uh, kind of under your control. Yeah. yeah. And another thing, probably kind of worth mentioning, uh, uh, like, I wouldn't say, like, we, we try to work from office, uh, uh, as, not everybody, you know, like, uh, uh, but, uh, for example, sales, management, uh, marketing, design, um, uh, HR, we try to be almost every day. Of course, there's flexibility, but we try to be almost every day in office because, Especially when it comes to brainstorming different initiatives about marketing, about uh, sales approaches, what works, what doesn't work, what we can kind of change, how we can uh, come up with some new products or, 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 or new testing initiatives. Uh, at least from my perspective, I, uh, it is possible remotely, but it is nowhere near as efficient, you know, like if like-minded people come in a room and brainstorm, uh, you know, speak each with other and then and, and, and c- c- come up with some you know, great new initiatives. It just kind of works better. Um, again, there are people who love it, people who hate it. Uh, oh, it and, seems uh, like this and, is uh, the new, this, this might um, be the new polarizing thing, you know, vaccines or Democrat or Republican. <laughs> and now it's like back to the office or, or fully remote. Or I think it's like so, yeah. so strong opinions on, on both sides. It's a, uh, yeah. be interesting to have some uh, strong uh, founders debate, uh, this, sure, sure. Uh, like but, a proper but, debate format. But, but, but still, we try to keep it kind of flexible. With some exceptions, of course, there are a couple of um, uh, projects, you know, like where testing happens from secure facilities, what I mentioned before, and there's just impossible, you know, due to high uh, confidentiality of products being tested, it's just impossible to do it from home. Uh, imagine, you know, like this, so sensitive, let's say, builds or products that... Uh, um, cannot be leaked anywhere, and, and, and it, uh, it, it can only happen from office. And in those situations, of course, there is no other possibility uh, than to carry out uh, testing from from office from uh, specific secure facilities. 
All right. All right, Edwin. Thanks. Uh, very interesting stuff and obviously very critical. And sometimes we tend to all over overlook this, you know, going to go production and then let the users test it, <laughs> and, uh, move fast, break things, and it's going to be fine. And, and who, and who, you know, has this obscure Nokia phone anymore or whatever. Mm. Let's just focus on, on Samsung and iPhone. Uh, so, so yeah, very important, uh, to, to, to keep things clean and, and neat and, uh, and well tested. So, so thanks for sharing your experiences. Really happy you, yeah. for, for, for the story. Um, do not hesitate to be more vocal about it also in the local, uh, local tech scene and, uh, circles. I think you've done a great job and, uh, and people should, uh, know more about it and, and, and hopefully be inspired. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Edwin. Thank you. And thank you for posting the, uh, the podcast. It's really good having conversa conversations with you. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. All right. And to the listeners, we see you next week. Uh, click that subscribe button and don't forget to see us on YouTube as well. T test that subscribe button on, uh, on Spotify, please, listeners. For yeah, us. Like, test, go and try see to if test it works. whether it works. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you.